Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to present to you about uh, drivers of premature mortality in the United States. Uh, I would like to talk briefly about the Institute for Health Metric and Evaluation, then talk about the premature mortality and its drivers in the U.S., talk briefly about health disparities and summary and next steps. I have more slides than what I'm presenting here, but I wanted to have a full deck of slides that we can share with you. But I want to give you a flavor of some of these slides and the rest you will have available. And I'll show you also where the data you could get. All the slides that uh, I am presenting are available online and you could access them. Uh, the Institute for Health Metric and Evaluation is 11 years old, uh, and we are focused on answering three critical questions. Uh, what are the world's health problem, which is a geographic unit, Alabama? What are the health problems of Alabama, for example? And how well are we addressing these problems? How is the society in that location addressing these problems? And the third one, which is the most difficult one, is how we best allocate our resources to maximize our health impact. We are about uh, 450 full-time professionals here at the University of Washington in Seattle. We have about 30 plus 35 full-time faculty. We have a scientific member, and we have a variety of scientists, statisticians, epidemiologists, modelers, IT, visualization. And the most important part is we have over 4,300 international collaborators working with us uh, in 145 countries. And briefly, some of our the products that we produce here at IHME, and I'll talk about some of them in detail. The first one is uh, the global burden of disease, and I will talk more about it in detail. The second one is we call it future health scenarios, where we take a burden of disease and project it to the future, and we say that will be its normal projection, what will happen if everybody performs at a better case scenario? In this case, life expectancy will increase. And what a country or a location uh, performs at a certain indicator. So where diabetes would be in 2040, what happens if obesity goes down by 5% and so on? We have a project called the Local Burden of Disease, where we do at 5 by 5 kilometers. We monitor all the sustainable health sustainable development goal for every country in the world. Uh, we do uh, everything we produce here is by also something called uh, sociodemographic index where we look at fertility, income, and education, and we rank countries based on this sociodemographic index, and this allows us to show if a country is performing as it's expected or not. And we produce something called human capital index for ages 20 to 60. What is the probability of death, their educational level? And at IHME, we don't only use education as years of schooling. We also do something called learning, where we rank countries and locations on uh, international tests or national tests. So it's a quality of education, not only years of school. Uh, we have an indicator called health access uh, and quality of care, which we do it for every country in the world. We track money, global health financing, and its projection to 2050, what countries are spending out of pocket, uh, insurance, inpatient, outpatient, what are the driving of increase of cost. And for the United States, we publish on factors that are associated with health spending in the U.S., and this is one of the slides shows you, like, expenditure on drugs are increasing, utilization for inpatients is coming down, outpatient is increasing, and we do this for every country in the world. Briefly, these products are available on our web and detailed information and publication in Lancet or in JAMA for each one of them. The Global Burden of Disease is a systematic scientific effort to quantify in a comparative magnitude, so allows comparability between states and uh, countries. All health loss from major diseases, injuries, and risk factor by age sex over time from 1990 till now. And for many countries, we do this at the subnational level, Indonesia, China, India, USA, Russia, UK, Mexico, Pakistan, uh, US, of course, now we're doing it at the state level, and we have a contract from uh, NIH to do it at the county level by SES now and by... Uh, 
race, ethnicity as well. The global burden of disease covers 359 diseases and injuries and their sequela, diabetes, amputation, diabetes, blindness, and 84 risk factors. And in addition to the traditional metrics that we use in epidemiology, prevalence, incidence, uh, death rates, we have three new indicators. The first one is years of life loss. Where we look at mortality, we, we take the highest life expectancy in the world, say Japanese woman, 86 plus, 86.9. So somebody dying in D.C. at age 60, that's 26.9 years lost, and we could assign it to a disease or a risk factor. And this measure not only tells you mortality in a country, but how early the death is occurring, which is a good indicator as premature mortality, for example. Years lived with disability is if somebody in D.C. at age 60 gets diabetes, and depending on the severity of the disease, we will assign a disability weight, and then we will measure through this years of uh, lived with disability what's ailing us. So mental health, for example, anxiety, depression, uh, rarely kill, but they are associated with a high disability, and we are able to account for that. And disability adjusted life years DALIs is the combination of YLLs and YLDs, which is the two before. And it's a good indicator of health of a population because it tells you what's killing the population and tells you what ailing the population and how early the death is occurring in that population. And then by having disability, we can look at life expectancy and subtract from it the disability, and we can provide something called healthy life expectancy, how healthy a population is living before uh, disability starts. And this is a good indicator as well of quality of life. Uh, GBD has uh, different grouping for disease, so uh, we have three levels, communic communicable diseases, non-communicable, and injuries. But within each one, for example, cancer here, we have uh, 23 types of cancer, and for some cancers, in this case liver cancer, we can say liver cancer due to hepatitis B, hepatitis C, alcohol use, and others. Same for the risk factors. We have metabolic risk factor, environmental, and behavioral. And then within behavioral, you could have dietary risk factors, and diet will have different component, uh, processed meat, red meat, and so on. We are very transparent in what we do at IHME, where we uh, everything we produce is available on the web, and I'll show you how to access it, but also not only the uh, data that we produce, even the programs, the code, R codes or STATA code that we use to produce this, these numbers are available uh, for users, and they can download it from the web, and they're available on something called Global Health Data Exchange, where you could see our results and you could download our codes as well. This is the GBD compare that we use to show the visualization uh, of our results, and I'll uh, briefly go out of it, uh, of my presentation and show you how to use it. But let me give a couple of slides, and I'll go back to that, and this way you could see where I get this data and how I got these slides. We're using more and more in GBD clinical informatics, where we have medical records. From 47 countries, we have about 7 billion medical records right now that we could use it also to see what people are admitted for and what kind of uh, diseases and outcomes they are receiving when they go to a hospital or to a clinic. So let me talk a little bit about premature mortality and its drivers. Premature mortality is defined here by under 70 years of age. And here, this was a grant that we got from the Office of Disease Prevention. Dr. Murray, who introduced me, uh, and his team gave us this grant that allowed us here at IHME for the first time to be able to produce data for under 70 as a group. And also because we were able to group different age group, we were able to create other age group as well, in addition to this, uh, what the grant allowed us to do, which opened doors for us, and I'll show you that in a moment. So if you look at the uh, top 20 causes of death, this is mortality in the United States. In 1990, what was the rank? Ischemic heart disease. It's still in 2007 ischemic heart diseases. But you could see in 2017, the biggest increase was for drug use disorder, cirrhosis, self-harm has remained at five. And one of the things that are increasing in the U.S., COPD as causes of death and diabetes. If I move right now to under 
70 causes of death what are the risk factors that are contributing to this premature mortality in this case smoking is number one as you see here but high body mass index is increasing to be number two which is an indication why we're seeing an increase in diabetes systolic blood pressure is coming down to number three from number two high fasting plasma glucose again from diabetes drug use becoming uh, number five here a due to the epidemic that we have on drug, and you'll see more data on that. Now, if I'm looking at DALIS, which is uh, disability and mortality combined, it's uh, drug use disorder is number one. Ischemic heart disease will become number two. Then back pain and diabetes, which is surprisingly be number four here, uh, uh, it has increased tremendously from uh, 1990 to 2017 as a result of obesity and glucose as well. And this is one way we can, look, we call it decomposition of risk factors. So this is high body mass index being the number one risk factor in this case. And you could see what are the contribution that body, high body mass index is leading in premature DALI. So let me switch the screen here and show you how you could get this data and what visualization we have. If you Google GBD compare, you can get this view from uh, IHME. And then if you go to use advanced setting, the grant allowed us to do ages less, less than 70, and we have different age group as part of this effort. And again, thanks to NIH for doing this. So if I click on under 70, and I'm going here for the United States, and you could pick any states you want. And what I have showed you, for example, DALIs, you could level two or level three, you could see you, drug use disorder. When you click on it, you could see the change in this case, 187.3, and then how many DALIs are in. So when you go to the web, this data is accessible. You could download the visualization or the data behind it as well. And one of the slides that I'm going to show you here is percent DALIs from each of, uh, by age, let me move my screen a little bit, by age for every age group here, and then 70 to 75, less than 70. And what, what is going on here, let me show you mortality first, deaths. You could see the injuries and the transportation, self-harm being a bigger burden early on in age, self-harm, 32% for age 20 to 24. And you could see how substance use disorder is high in this age group, cancer increasing and then decreasing, cardiovascular uh, diseases start increasing and keep going up, neurological disorders. And then if I move the, to DALIs, you could see a totally different picture here where substance use disorder is pro uh, causing the biggest burden in this age group. And then musculoskeletal disorder, back pain, and you could see how diabetes is increasing by age. So whatever, all the slides that I'm presenting are available on the web, and it's very hard to see the colors in one of my slides, but here you can scroll on it and you could see the numbers. So let me go back to the presentation. And this way I can skip some of these slides uh, that I showed you that are available on the web. This is one of our visualization on the web that I'm looking at the composition of deaths in the United States by cause and sex for ages under 70. And you could see here uh, more mortality for males than females, of course. You could see more cardiovascular diseases and more cancers for men than women in this age group. Of course, more self-harm, more unintentional, uh, more... Uh, Transport injuries, especially at younger age, as I showed you. But again, you could see more drugs and uh, drug use disorder as well for this age group. So more risk factors. And basically, uh, in how to say it nicely, men behave badly, and uh, these are risk factors are driving these outcomes, and they do so more than women in many of these risk factors. If I look at cancer, for example, and I give you an example, and again, available on our web, you could see here for cancers, uh, the biggest one here is lung cancer, that color. And you could see more lung cancer for men than women. And again, that's a uh, indication of risk factor. Men smoke more than women, and they peak their smoking 
uh, before women and women peaked later. But again, still, they smoke more and they have more lung cancer, for example. DALI is a totally different picture where you could see more about mental health here, more about use disorder as well, and a huge variation by sex, and a huge variation by sex when it comes to transport injuries. But the main drivers here, as you will see, are basically risk factors that are driving this variation between man and woman. This is this as well, and this is now I'm showing you risk factors and what are the risk factors that are driving this. You could see malnutrition in this case in the U.S., very small. Tobacco, alcohol use, and drugs are big. And then unsafe sex in some places and varies by state. But high blood pressure, huge variation by state, huge variation in uh, high body mass index by state. Uh, and low bone and mineral uh, mineral density as well. Again, on our web, you could click on each number and see the amount itself and how big it is. I'm going to spend some time on this one, which is very important to show. So this is the probability of deaths in the United States by sex. And if I show you the total one, both sexes here, that would be the probability of dying for age 20 to 69, 22 less, uh, to 70, for uh, in 1990 so it used to be about 20 let's say 26 in this case it went down for the whole country to about 21 percent in 2017 this dark line so a major achievement a huge reduction in probability of deaths for 20 to 70 in this age group much more for men the reduction than for women but also the current probability of dying for men in the United States for this age group is still higher than that of women in 1990. And that's a very important point. We expect that women have less mortality in this age group and they live longer and they have higher life expectancy. And we see it in many countries in the world. But that percentage of a decline for male in the United States is much lower than what we see in other countries. And let me break it down a little bit. So, if I show you this one for 20 to 70 by state, now I'm showing you for all states. I'm sorry about this again available on our web. This is 1990 all states. This is uh, 2017, the reduction that I've shown you before. You could see many countries as scrolled down. Many states are still higher than the average, which is expected. But for all the states here, there was an improvement, smaller for some state. But there is a improvement, except one of the states here, Oklahoma, where the probability increased. But everybody, everybody, 20 to 70, every state by variation, some success story, New York State, for example, was above average in 1990, now below average in 2017. So there's some success story that we can see. Now let me break this 20 to 50, not to 55, not 20 to 70. 20 to 55, and you could see a huge variation in probability of mortality. First, the reduction is much less. Then many states, the probability has increased, did not decrease. And you could see here, that's an increase. That's an increase in Wyoming. That's an increase in Alaska. That's an increase in Indiana. And then this grant allowed us to show that, to show that even for this age group, premature deaths to 70, if you break it down for premature deaths to 55, between 20 to 55, there is a huge variation, and many states are going backward, and the majority of the states are stagnant. Few states have made an improvement. And so this age group in the United States has had an increase of probability of deaths between 1990 and 2017. Now, less than 20, we published this in JAMA, and for every state, there was an improvement in probability of deaths for age group. So the ages 20 to 55, we have seen a decline and a reverse of the success that we have seen before. I'll skip some of these slides. Uh, we have ratio male to female. You could do it again on our web. But one of the things that we could show uh, and available on our web is observed over expected. So giving your socioeconomic factor, sociodemographic index, are you performing at the level that you should be performing? For drug use in the United States, all states are not, which no surprise to all of us. 
Tobacco, we're doing better than we are expected, but there is a huge variation between the states. Uh, more, more than we are expected, tobacco is declining, but you could see some states better than other states. And then you look at all these risk factors, some of them are above intimate uh, partner violence, and safe water for some of the state, diet for many places we're doing better than expected, but not so for high fasting plasma glucose, alcohol, a huge variation by state between one state, some state are doing above uh, better, some states are not, obesity, all of us, all the states are doing much worse than are expected to do. And I'll skip some of these slides, we have this again on our web, where you could look at a year of life loss, decomposition. And here, what's really interesting in this slide is what are driving these changes? Is it due to the population aging? Again, this is under 70. Is it due to population aging? Is it due to change in population growth? We're growing, we have more people right now. Uh, risk factors are declining. And then what are the risk factors that are driving this? So I want to point three states. Washington, D.C. here, not a state, but uh, this is New Jersey and New York, where you could see a decline what you would expect because now we have more population, why allowed to increase? But still, you've seen a success story in these three. New York and New Jersey have done a great job in handling the risk factor and giving away the reasons here. The C, unfortunately, when you look at it, is a change of demographic more than a change of risk factors. So the people are changing the risk factor, but at the same time, Poor people are pushed out of the city and uh, the change of the demographic and the educational level and fertility and income in D.C. is a big driver. I mentioned that we are doing something called future health scenarios where we're looking at uh, 2040. This is life expectancy in 2040. The United States is now in, 1990, uh, in, in 2016. Uh, this is not 2017. The projection were based on 2016 was number 19. We are projecting this to be number 52. One thing I want you to notice here that uh, this is both sexes, that uh, our rank will decrease, whereas many countries will in, uh, will improve their rank, but the United States will go down to 52. Some of our uh, future health scenarios here, where we're looking at high body mass index. You could see the projected, it will increase. The United States has a lot of job to do. We could level this one if we perform better by reducing, uh, by improving diet and physical activity. And it could be worse if we don't tackle this risk factor. So it's very important what we see in this future health scenarios is some of the gains that we see. And here is blood pressure is a better example. Some of the gains we see, we cannot take for granted. So we expect the blood pressure to keep coming down slowly. We could do better on the green, but we could see a reverse in the United States if we don't stay vigilant on some of these risk factors that are driving uh, other risk factors and other diseases here in the US. So the message from these future health scenarios is don't take the success stories that you have seen for granted. We should still focus on risk factor and prevention as well. And I'm skipping some slides. Briefly talk about health disparities. Uh, and all these slides, again, all these visualization are available in the U.S. So if you look in 2014, and here I'm using 2014 because we have county data in 2014. Now we're updating this to counties using mortality in 2016. So if you look at counties in the United States, 75 years in Mississippi as a state and 81 years in Hawaii. So a huge difference. Six years are big. Six years is a huge difference in life expect. When you look at counties, so you have a county here, uh, Oklala in South Dakota, 67, 87 in Summit County in Colorado. So in Colorado, in a county, people are living, this is uh, both sexes, people are living more than a Japanese woman, 86.9. And you have people 67, what we see in some places in West Africa, much lower than Lebanon, where I come from, uh, even with a civil war in Lebanon. So huge variation that is why... In, uh, in this variation, and here I'm showing you the difference, not the outliers, 100 and uh, 0. I'm showing 1 to 99 percent. I'm taking the extreme outlier. These disparities are increasing with time and not decreasing. And that's a big problem for us in the United States. Even when you do it at a smaller unit, 
and our new grant with NIH also asked for four areas to do at the at a smaller unit. Here is census tract in uh, in King County. And you could see a King County where I live, Seattle, is above average in the United States, a rich county, but still a huge variation, 68 to 89. Basically, we have the United States in terms of its old disparity and the world to its lower extent was in our uh, city, was in our own county. And we're talking here, the difference is like 10 miles between one point to another point, if not less. We have these on our web, and I want to show you lung cancer, for example, variation of lung cancer. This is in 2014, uh, and this is the percent increase. You could see even for many counties in the United States, there is still increase in mortality from lung cancer, and other counties, we see a decline in mortality, minus 64 to almost 100 increase. So huge variation in the burden right now, in mortality, and also in the rates of increase. Driving, what driving this is smoking. So the map of smoking for males is a good predictor of mortality for lung cancer. Uh, now I want to show you another one. Testicular cancer, rare, you know, very conditioned, few people die from it. But there are huge variation in this country. And this is a disease, you know, the lung cancer I showed you, that's based on risk factors. This one is based on medical care. Uh, if anybody goes to a, med to a doctor, they would not die from testicular cancer. So mortality, you know, survival is very high. But you could see huge variation in many counties, especially in the southeast. You could see an increase. Uh, and then many, many counties, we see a decrease. Breast cancer, which is a combination of risk factor and screening, you could see many places here, a huge variation in rates of mortality, age is just a standardized here, 51 to 11, almost five times the variation was in our country, and then many counties are decreasing, but at the same time, some counties, again, there is an increase here. Uh, Self-harm, unfortunately, it increased in almost every county. California is spared in some places in Florida. Uh, drug use disorder, which is uh, the big epidemic, you could see a huge increase was a little more what you see in West Virginia and the area around West Virginia. Uh, binge drinking, we could see also an increase on females more than may, uh, males in the United States. Still men do more binge drinking than women, but there is a rapid increase among females, and we published that from the RFSS. So what is driving these disparities? Briefly, socioeconomic inequalities, education, income, uh, lack of financial access to health care, which is insurance and also under insurance, poor quality of care, and I want to talk a little bit about this. It's not only uh, medical errors. It's uh, once somebody is into the medical care, how well they are being followed to make sure that they are receiving the benefit of the treatment that they are uh, getting. So basically somebody who has blood pressure and now is receiving medical care, is he or she have a blood pressure control, yes or no? That's very important. And we have measures in the United States to track that and we pay attention to it, not as much as we should. And there are huge variation in the United States of this quality. But the second one, which is important here, is how long did it take somebody who was a first sign of danger to go to the medical care. And we know in the United States this is a huge variation. So Ali Mokdad having chest pain, how long does it take Ali Mokdad with a chest pain to go to a doctor and say, I'm having this chest pain, check me. And then this is early detection, and we know that does a little bit more in prevention of mortality and other complications and morbidity. But the biggest one, what is driving these are preventable causes of death, preventable risk factors of death. And we published this in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine, where we looked at socioeconomic factors, poverty, median income, college education, high school, unemployment, African-American, uh, American Indian, uh, Alaska Native, and Hispanics. We looked at five risk factors. I want you to keep this in mind. Five, only five risk factors, obesity, physical inactivity, smoking, hypertension, and diabetes. And we looked at quality of medical care insurance, quality from uh, Dartmouth uh, in, uh, University, and medical doctor av availability, indicators of medical doctor at the county level. And here, the outcome that we're looking at is life expectancy. So I need to be very careful here. What I'm presenting is how all these three factors explain 
life expectancy, variation in life expectancy. So medical care alone, access and quality, 27% of the variation. If you level the playing field in all counties, 27% of life expectancy disparities, what I showed you, will disappear if we have the same medical care here. If we address socioeconomic factors, 60% of this disappear. If we address these five risk factors, 74, so if you do it combined, all of these together, it's 74. So basically, all these disparities are manifested through risk factors. Now, I have to admit here, socioeconomic factors, these indicators are very important to tackle for our country because they impact our economical development. They impact a lot of other things. But I'm talking about life expectancy here. 74% is risk factors. So addressing risk factors uh, are, are very important in order to do. So what are my summar summary briefly here? Regardless of the metric we use in the United States, we're not performing as well as we should do. We're falling behind other countries, high-income countries, our competitors. Most counties in the United States are falling behind. Even if the country, as a, on average, we see an improvement in life expectancy, very slow, not as, mu as much as other countries are doing of our economical mind. But many of our counties and states are left behind. Females are falling behind faster than males, which is shocking in this country. And you look at the maternal mortality in the U.S. is much worse than maternal mortality in Lebanon and many countries in the Middle East. I mean, this is unexplained in the United States. We have huge disparities in the U.S., even within my state and even within King County, one of the counties that are supposed to be rich, Microsoft, Amazon, Boeing, you name it, and Starbucks, our contribution to the world. And large number of these deaths can be prevented premature mortality can be prevented by addressing risk factors. So what we are working right now at IHME, and we're fortunate to have this contract from NIH to do it at the county level, is what are the future magnitude uh, of and trend of diseases at the county level? What are the disparities? There are disparities among certain groups by SES and by race ethnicity. What are the health care cost implications, spending, absenteeism, retirement, early retirement, disability? What are the drivers of increased diseases of burden in here and increase in expenditure, health expansion? And what can we do here by looking at these variations by county and look at what counties that giving orders all of these factors are doing better than expected or counties that should do better are not doing very well? Why and what can we do in order to address this shift? So briefly, in GBD 2019, IHME is moving from using uh, scoring risk factor to an outcome. We use right now the World Cancer Research Fund. Many people use GRADE. Both of them, if you go to their web, are very subjective, and people score the evidence. And IHME is now developing a methodology to score evidence based on star system, to, similar to when you go to Amazon to buy something. There's a five star, four star, and not only risk outcome, we're very much interested in intervention policy and outcome. So IHME is now moving from only showing you what the burden of disease, but moving into translation and implementation and showing you what works, giving that deck of card that you have, giving your geographic location, because the solution in a county like uh, King County in Seattle is going to be different than Fulton County in Atlanta, Georgia, or any other county, uh, Mercer County, for example, in West Virginia, because the solution has to be local based on the deck of card and the problem space. So right now, HME is working on conducting a systematic analysis and forecasting this to 2050. All the literature analyzed success and failures from all the intervention failure is as important as uh, success, because we don't want to repeat the mistake, and we want to visualize this. We have done all the work at IHME for forecasting. This one is missing the comprehensive review. We did risk factor and outcome from GBD, now intervention that we are trying to do. And then budget, and how could you maximize your budget and return on your investment. And we want to have a visualization, and briefly I will end soon. This will be the trend. This is a true one in Nigeria. If you click on one of them, it brings the intervention, diarrhea risk factor, zinc deficiency, vitamin A deficiency. It tells you where you want the intervention to do it. It will give you a star system for this intervention if you pick on it. 
then if you apply one of these intervention, it will show you how your burden will change, diarrhea is coming down, how faster it will increase, and the cost differential, and how much you're saving in future costs when you do this. And if I want a user to reduce disparity, what I should invest my money, or if I have that much money, what I should invest it as well in terms of getting maximum return on investment. So IHME is working with a lot of partners right now to move from not only showing you the burden, but also, so what? What can we do about it? And this is a work in progress. And we have some early funding, but we don't have secure funding for all of it. But we're heading into that direction. Uh, I went fast through all of these slides because they're available on the web. This is my email address. I'm happy to take any questions. What we have seen from this grant, and again, thanks for NIH, uh, that uh, there is a huge variation in uh, by state in premature deaths, mainly among 20 to 55. It's not only drugs, it's also other risk factors. We have seen an increase in diabetes in this age group, driven by obesity and uh, glucose uh, as well. And there is a huge variation by states, and there are lessons to be learned from states who have done a good job, and they can share that lessons for other states. New York here is a big example, and New York City, for example. So thank you, everybody, and um, we have time for questions. And I can't hear anything, so I'm still the speaking, I guess, but I can't hear what you guys are saying. Well, now. Can, you can you hear us now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, technical problem there. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> we have a number of questions. Um, uh, some initially on the um, the focus of today's presentation, which was the uh, risk factors uh, drivers for premature death. <clears throat> there was a slide you showed early in that sequence that suggested that many of the risk factors for premature death that were at the top of the list in 1990 were still at the top of the list in 2017. Am, am I remembering those those data correctly? No, that's true, except for, unfortunately, drug use, which shut down to be one of the top five. Yes, right. but you're right. I mean, it's, uh, it's the usual typical one, obesity, uh, uh, glucose, and blood pressure, smoke, yes. Yes, and, and diet and so forth. And diet. That, that, that so, and um, if, uh, if we tried to forecast looking forward uh, 20 years, uh, if we don't do anything uh, special to address those problems, are those still going to be the leading risk factors? Yes, and they would have even a higher burden on us than what we are seeing right now. Yes, you're correct. <clears throat> so there's a, a loud message there to all of us that we need to focus uh, attention on the leading risk factors for premature death and try to uh, improve uh, the distribution of those risk factors in the U.S. Uh, or we're likely to, to be in the same situation uh, going forward that we're in now. Uh, yes, there, there we can see the, the, the leading risk factors. So you're looking at the leading risk factor in 2040. You could see from our uh, high body mass index, high blood pressure, tobacco, high fasting, plasma, glucose, and alcohol, these five are still top. And then here, the slide, the dark one, is what we are expecting. We could do better in the United States, which is the green. And then if we don't, if we perform at 85 uh, at 15. So the way here we're looking at this, let me explain it. This one is what the, uh, what the future is. This one is we perform at 85, so rank all, count, uh, all in the world from 100 to 0 is the best. Don't take the outliers. The green is you perform at 85, the red if you perform at 15. So yes, in the United States, you correct. These will still be with us unless we tackle them, and the message is loud and clear from our data that we should spend investment on dealing with risk factors at the community level, yes. 
Right. Uh, that message also comes through in a slide that you showed. Uh, I believe it's from a paper that was published uh, a year or so ago uh, showing that uh, the uh, behavioral risk factors and metabolic risk factors account for 74% uh, of the county level variability in, in life expectancy. Yeah, it's this slide showing that um, uh, if you consider SES and healthcare and risk factors, you explain 74% of the variability, but you explain the same amount just with the risk factors. So five, that it, only these top five, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's quite likely that uh, variability attributable to, otherwise attributable to SES or medical care is mediated uh, by the risk factors. So, and the message here is, if you address these risk factors, in reality, who's going to benefit the most out of it is people who are in the low SES because they tend to be higher, at having higher risk factors. So, uh, that's a very important message is, for us, until in this country, we address the major issues we have in uh, socioeconomic factors, poverty, income, and education, and employment, and the issues that we are them and raised, uh, we can start right now by addressing the risk factors. Uh, and then we have to spend a lot of time and make sure that there is not pollution that will fit all out uh, different but we have to invest in prevention, and risk factors are the best investment right now. Right. Uh, we hear the argument in some quarters that uh, we need to focus on upstream issues like uh, social determinants of health, and uh, uh, from other quarters the argument that, well, we need to address the risk factors. Can you uh, share your thoughts on, on that, those competing arguments, given uh, what your data suggests? Uh, you know, the, the sad part, Dr. Murray, here is this is not a horse race. We should address both of them. But uh, uh, we, we're a country, I mean, uh, we spend $3.5 trillion on health as a country. And the whole world, all world spent $8 trillion. So we're almost like, you know, almost half what the world spent on health. And look at our outcome. So we really need to look at where we are investing and how we invest. Our data is clearly showing risk factor is the best return on investment. And then if we are to improve life expectancy and health outcomes in this country, especially among minorities and people with low SEM, we need to tackle the risk factors among these people and empower them to make uh, And that's very important. Again, but it's not a horse race. So the economic factors are important for other reasons as well. Right. One of the uh, uh, causes of death and, and disability in this country that's been exploding in the last uh, decade has been uh, drug use, particularly driven by opioids. And you seem to be able to uh, track that in your data. What about something that's even more recent, uh, which is vaping, um, the, the use of uh, electronic nicotine delivery systems that are used to deliver not only nicotine, but uh, THC and, and all sorts of other things that people get when they're buying these products on the street. Is the uh, uh, GBD system sensitive to those kinds of very recent developments in terms of uh, causes of uh, disease and, and morbidity? Yeah, GBD adds, uh, you know, like we didn't have Zika, for example, for 2016. We added it in, uh, when we started having data. So right now, GBD... 2017, we didn't have vaping, uh, and now we're looking at adding vaping. Uh, for recent years, of course, there is no historic data from 1990 on that. But uh, the moment we have uh, a few countries, uh, prevalence and outcome, uh, we add it automatically. Yes, we can modify GBD and add the new risk factors as we go. Yeah. <coughs> GBD, uh, GBD 2019, uh, will not uh, report on vaping, but 2021. Okay, well, we look forward to that. And uh, uh, by that time, uh, FDA may have taken some action to uh, uh, formally uh, deter uh, use by by greatly limiting access. But we'll we'll see what comes out of FDA over the next couple of months. I hope so. I totally looking forward to that. That yeah. no more. Yeah. <clears throat> And I wish I could share more, but some of that is still uh, in clearance. Um, 
Uh, we have lots of questions from people who want to know how do you do this, how do you do that in the global burden of disease uh, data and the visualization uh, tools. Um, uh, let me ask a, a, a general question. How can uh, members of our, of our viewing audience learn more about how to use uh, the visualization tools and learn how to access the data? What's a, what's a good way for people to do it? Thanks, Dr. Murray. Uh, the best way to do it, uh, GBD is a collabor collaborative effort. So uh, on our web is uh, something called Call for Collaborators. If anybody wants to join us as a collaborator, they get uh, access to free training, how, how we do GBD, how we look at visualization. They'll also get our data head publications. So if you are a collaborator now with us, you will see GBD 2019 before it's finalized and published and you have a chance to provide comment. You will also be invited to join as a proposer if you want to and you contribute to the manuscript and you'll get a draft version of it and you'll be involved in the write up as well. So I encourage people who are interested in GBD, all these questions, how you do it, how I can get the visualization to join us as collaborators and then they will have access to everything. Also, if anybody has a question, we have uh, GBD secretariat, so to send an email or to me personally, and I'm happy to answer those as well. But join us to be collaborative. I, I know that you have um, uh, recently um, established a contract with NIH uh, that will explore uh, issues of um, uh, leading of causes and risk factors uh, as a function of race, ethnicity, at least in the United States. Could you uh, say a little bit about that work that's going to get started soon and and uh, what what you see coming out of that? Uh, yes, thank you. So we are really fortunate, honored, and humbled that NIH picked us for the staff work. So we have produced a global government in the United States at the state level. And we have provided in the United States some of the data I showed you, like the mortality, breast cancer, and others. We have provided non-fatal, I mean, uh, fatal outcomes, uh, mortality at the county level. But we haven't been able to do the disability at the county level and uh, full-blown GBD. So the contract from uh, NIH is to do uh, a full-blown uh, global burden of disease with some risk factors, and not all the risk factors early on, and to do it by socioeconomic factor, education, income at the county level, and by uh, race and ethnicity and the county level when applicable, of course. And this is a three years uh, contract with IHME, and the first of it should be a draft of this data and the second year of the contract that we would share with all our collaborators to be published, the final publication on year three, after we vet all these numbers. And then in that contract as well, there is a, uh, a request to do four uh, counties or large metropolitan area at a smaller level, uh, census tract, uh, depending on accessibility of data, to show also not only variation by county, but like what I showed you, variation within like King County, variation within a county, because sometimes, even when I talked in my presentation today, that New York City made improvement on New York State, but not everybody in New York City made the same improvement at the same level. Um, we have a question from one of our uh, participants about uh, maternal mortality uh, and whether it's possible to investigate um, uh, 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 factors related to maternal mortality, for example, in the U.S. or in other areas or how it compares in the U.S. to other countries. Yes, if you if you go to our web, uh, GBD compare when I showed you, a uh, very good question, by the way, and you look at mortality and you look at maternal mortality, you could see variation by country and by geographic area. And you could also see observed over expected, basically what countries are doing better than they should. And then we have a GBD, like any model we do, uh, is we have all the risk factors in that model. So we can tell what is driving uh, this mortality here in the United States. So I mentioned the uh, maternal mortality in the U.S. because it's really, I mean, among all the top rich countries, the 45 of them, none of them have our maternal mortality. I mean, if you look even in our 
in Americas all the way to Chile, except for Mexico. We have the, one of the worst maternal mortality in the United States. And we know from our data what are the drivers of this mortality, and we know what are the things that we could intervene on. So part of it in the United States, one of it is drug, of course, and then uh, drug use and alcohol use, but also access to prenatal care and prenatal care. So many unintended pregnancy and uh, not as much prenatal care in the United States as much as we would like to see. And these are driving uh, an increased maternal mortality in the U.S. Huge variation by county in the United States by maternal mortality. You could see affluent counties are doing much better. And everything that we look at GBD in terms of what explains these variation are really the four drivers I told you, the socioeconomic factors, access to health care insurance and underinsured medical care, you know, early, how early you go as a female to a doctor, uh, and then uh, can they tell you ahead of time that you have signs of danger and then you need to go and deliver in the hospital and make sure you've been followed up properly. And of course, there is the smoking, the alcohol, the drugs that are driving some of this mortality. But it's mainly preventable risk factors like for everything else. And the sad part in the United States in 2017, our data, a woman my daughter, my sister, whatever, you know, or my mom, if I'm a child, should not die because she got pregnant. And then we should do something about it. Yes. Thank you. Um, have some methods questions. Um, <clears throat> people um, in this country or, or in other countries may get their health care uh, they may get sick, they may die in a location quite different from where they live. So um, someone living in uh, rural western Washington, for example, uh, and getting exposed to environmental factors and diet and other kinds of things there may seek health care, uh, sorry, I'm poor uh, eastern Washington, uh, may seek their health care in Seattle. Uh, which is a very different area. Uh, uh, how does GBD handle that kind of issue in terms of uh, 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 linking uh, mortality or morbidity with uh, uh, risk factors? Uh, so we, as I mentioned, we have medical record in the United States, which is called proven data. We have that data. And then we have on that medical record, where do you live and uh, of course, and we know where you're seeking medical care. So for many countries in the world, when we have a medical record, that's easy to address. For countries, for example, like in, uh, in Africa, where we don't have medical record. We have from surveys data, especially for maternal and, uh, maternal and child health because of DHS surveys, MAC does these DHS surveys. We have in that survey, we have a question. Of course, we know where you live. We have a question. Where do you seek medical care? So we have an idea about the variation on health-seeking patterns, and we do that. And also for countries where we have few medical records, we also have from surveys, uh, when you get sick, did you go to a doctor? So we could adjust for the percentage and the demographic of people who go to the medical care when we use our medical record when we don't have a comprehensive medical record for a country. So there are ways to adjust it for it and could look at that. And even right now, it's part of our contract with NIH, the one you mentioned at the county level. One of our faculty who is the senior statistician on the grant is also applying for, uh, I shouldn't say that, but to look at uh, migration in the United States, also like where you live, where you move, and how this impact life expectancy. But what's funny in the United States, and this is leading to another topic, is like if you look at Florida, for example, where everybody says people, older people are moving to Florida. And when you do a standardization, you know, and you could see that healthier people are moving to Florida, and you could see that impact. So even if people move and you do a standardization, you could see are they healthier or uh, uh, people are interested in learning more about the methods that are used in the Global Burden of Disease Project. Um, I, I presume that uh, methods are regularly published, that, that uh, information about methods is available on your website. Could you say a few words about that? Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, these are very good questions. So the, the methods, uh, again, I, I said IHM signed the uh, agreement called GAZA, where our methodology has to be released. So if you look at any of our publication and even on our web, you will see a detailed appendix of methodology for everything we do, what models, what we adjusted for, really detailed, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages. So if you are a reviewer of any of our manuscripts, you get thousands of those to review and methodology, detailed methodology. Uh, tells you what data we used, how we used it. The sources of data is available online for every country. And also for each model, it tells you what we use. And the code that produced that is available. IHME in general, briefly about methodology, is group. Uh, we have different group working on GPT. So we have uh, a group that does mentality, which gets us the envelope, which is our, our democracy. Then we have a group that does poses of that. One takes this envelope of mortality for each country and then look at causes of that. And then in that methodology, even for the United States, our number differ from those of CDC when it comes to causes of death because we have something called garbage code, where we have something called ill-defined causes of death that we adjust it by state. This varies by state, so it allows us to make a comparison across state, not impacted by the way state code code. And we provide a start system for quality of the causes of that. Then we have a team that works on risk factors. We have a team that works on disability. And then we have a team that works on everything else. And each was in each team that is within the risk factor that people are working on fire, that people are working on environment. And then we have something that we call it common indicator in GBD, where we have a team that works on education, income, and all these indicators, because are covariant that work for the moments. And GBD, we use different sources of data, and it has to make sense. They have to add up from surveys to mortality. I mean, you cannot say we use, like, cancer registry. We use uh, incidence to mortality to adjust our data. And our power is because we have this big data. Billion and billion of numbers are being produced every time we run GBD. And sometimes for many of the exposure, we use satellite, for example, for uh, environmental, we validated when there is a uh, station on the ground. Lots of details that are fully ex explained and fully available. And happy to discuss any of those methodologies specifically, and happy to connect you with the person who is in charge of that team. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid we've run out of time for today, so I, I want to thank you uh, very much, and I want to thank everyone who participated in today's webinar. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we'll be posting the slides and a recording of today's session on ODP's website next week. You will, each of the participants will receive an email with a link to the recording when it's available. Again, uh, uh, Ali, I want to say thank you uh, very much. Uh, I've enjoyed working with you on our project related to premature mortality and uh, look forward to continuing to work with you on the uh, uh, project, the county-specific project involving race, ethnicity, and, and SES factors. Thanks, everyone, for participating in the webinar. Thank you.